Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, if you want to scoot up a little closer, you sure may, um, making sure we can see everything. So um, thank you all for being here uh, today. Um, each year, uh, the City of Omaha's Lead Information Office partners up with local organizations to collaborate on a national outreach effort to observe National Lead Poisoning Prevention Week. Um, the NLPPW is a call to action to bring together families, individual, community-based organizations, state and local governments, and others to increase lead poisoning prevention awareness and increase efforts to reduce childhood exposure to lead. It also highlights the many ways parents can reduce children's exposures to lead in their home environment and prevent serious health effects. As a part of our local efforts, the City of Omaha comes together to bring education to nurses, physicians, and the community, and we recognize the local agencies that are involved in the lead education and prevention. And these are the following uh, local agencies and people uh, that are in this lead education and prevention are UNMC, Kimberly M. R. White, Methodist College, Dr. Echo Perlman, Douglas County Health Department, Nadia McCracken, City of Omaha, Stephen Zinvi, Midwest Training Institute, Philip Johnson, Omaha Healthy Kids Alliance, Tony Vargas. At this time, I also want to thank our sponsors, the Cherix Home Repair, uh, Window Innovations, and, sorry, just one moment. Uh, TV, uh, Public Access Omaha, Studio Management, Mike Wallace, are all here today. So thank you all for being here, and we can get started. Hi, good morning, almost good afternoon. My name is Kim White, as you just heard. I'm a pediatrician in training at the Creighton Children's and UNMT Combined Residency Program. I have one of my mentors here, Dr. Walburn, sitting in the middle. A little shout out ahead of time. Uh, it's my honor to be speaking today, and I really thank you for your interest in coming out today. It's my pleasure to share my clinical, public health, and research interest in pediatric lead exposure and management. Let's get going here. I have no disclosures, I have no financial obligations anywhere, uh, but I did change all patient information to remain HIPAA compliant and protective of their privacy. And before we get going, I wanted to talk a little bit about my background and how I've come to this particular interest and how I'm here in Omaha today. So I grew up in East Tennessee, went to public schools there, went on to upstate New York to study geology at Hamilton College, uh, and then went down that path and pursued graduate education in earth and environmental science, sciences down in Tulane. And I found that I really lost the connection to humans when I was doing this more lab-based research on Antarctic science. So then I, I shifted gears, and while I was applying to med school, I worked for one year at the National Science Foundation did get into med school at the University of Maryland in Baltimore, and then headed out west to Omaha, Nebraska, where I was first a adult neurology resident and kind of had a realization again that I really miss working with kids. It wasn't just people I wanted to work with, it was kids. So now I'm in my second year of pediatric training now. So with all that said, let's go ahead and get started. I have a few talking points that I wanted to get through. First, I wanted to review the sources of lead in our Omaha environment. I wanted to share the effect of lead on the developing child, uh, present two cases of pediatric lead exposure and management, uh, which allows me to review the CDC and the Department of Health and Human Services lead screening recommendations. And for this talk, I refer to lead screen as really the finger poke or the capillary blood sample. Uh, and then I'll go through how we're doing in lead screening in our Omaha schools that Dr. Echo Perlman's been doing here. And then lastly, share some resources that I have found particularly helpful. So I wanted to offer a very simple definition to start off with. Pediatric lead exposure is lead poisoning. There is no safe level of lead for our kids. In the United States, over 4 million households have children living in them that are exposed to lead. And half a million kids aged 1 to 5 have tested over 5 micrograms per deciliter. Which really leads me to say lead issues are at the crossroads of public health and medical practice, which brings a lot of us together in this room today. And we really have to start with prevention, which is why I wanted to start with reviewing the sources of lead in our environment. And some are very specific to the Omaha environment. The first is a universal exposure to lead, which is in paint in residential houses built before 1978. 
And I believe most of us know in this room, but lead paint chips are sweet to kids. So there's the, the impulse to keep picking away, which is also a fun activity, and then eating those chips. So that's a particularly large source of lead throughout the United States. More specific to Omaha is our history as a Superfund site. In 1998, the city of Omaha, a lot of us in this room, urged the Environmental Protection Agency to come investigate the cause of countless cases of pediatric lead poisoning in Omaha. And after very thorough investigation, the EPA found the source of lead to be in our soil. It affected 12 zip codes in an area over 8,800 acres. And again, after thorough investigation, the EPA found that the source of lead was put out in particulate admissions from this plant, ASARCO, or the American Smelting Company. Um, again, after a thorough investigation and a lot of money and a lot of effort, the EPA sampled over 42,000 residential properties and ended up replacing the soil in over 13,000 of those properties. So we've come a long way and we've seen a decline in those lead exposure cases in our kids since that time. So there's a really wonderful resource I wanted to share. Uh, the city representatives know very well about this resource, and hopefully a lot of us already do too, but it's the Omaha Lead Registry. You could go to it at www.omahalead.org. And just for demonstration purposes, I wanted to put in an address, and this is, happens to be where I live um, and how this website works. So I just made it into the Superfund site on the western edge on Seward Street. And just for reference, the white line is Dodge, and the little star is UNMC, where I spend most of my time. So here's my, my house. You get a picture, street view, and then you get when the, the test, when the house was sampled, and then what the lead was. Probably can't see it way back in the back, but I was about 80 parts per million when it was tested in the early 2000s. So you see a lot of colors up here. I'm going to step through what each of them mean. So again, my house is where the red arrow points. It's highlighted by yellow, but underneath the yellow, it's actually gray. Gray means that it was, the soil was tested, but no remediation was required. My property, again, was 80 parts per million. It was well under the 400 parts per million threshold that the EPA has set. And that threshold is based on adult exposures and how lead exposure in the soil goes into the blood, but it's not tested. We don't have a good value for what's a safe level for kids in our soil. To me, no lead in the soil would be good. We do know that lead is naturally present in the soil from geologic processes, usually 15 to 30 parts per million. But due to the activities of ASARCO and a few other plants in our area, we had levels well into the, to the hundreds of parts per million. So again, back to this graph, the blue properties have been tested and they actually did test over that 400 parts per million threshold and had their soil replaced. If the property is orange, it was tested, and they were over that level, but for whatever reason, uh, the property owner did not want that soil replaced. It was the property owner's decision whether they wanted the replacement or not, and we had to oblige. And you can be a little more reassured. A lot of the orange areas are either concrete areas or not residential properties like commercial properties, but not all of them. And then lastly, kind of um, the not, sorry, the red was tested in, required it but didn't get it, and then the orange it has not been tested at all. So moving on through other sources, uh, again back to more universal sources, as uh, lead potentially in our water supply, and this is in metal taps and in interior and exterior. And this gives me a little opportunity to talk about a somewhat recent issue back in 2014 in Flint, Michigan. Um, there was a transition from water sources from the Detroit Water Authority to the Flint water system. Uh, there was poor, control, poor corrosion control in the Flint water system, which led to lead being leached from these old pipes, exposing over, over 99,000 residents to extraordinary levels of lead. And in turn, a lot of those residents were actually children, and we did see a huge increase in pediatric lead levels during this time. They have since come back down, which is reassuring, but the damage is already done. Um, Kind of stepping back to some of these sources we're going to get through, a lot of imported products is a particular problem to Omaha with our large immigrant population. We can see lead in imported candies and spices. Lead, as I mentioned, is sweet and in powdered form. In any form, lead is heavy, so you can add that to imported products and make them cost more by weight, uh, and they're easy to hide because of that sweet taste. You can also find lead in the solder in canned foods which has been banned in the United States, but not universally. 
Uh, you can also see lead in pottery, jewelry, keys, hobbies, uh, particularly fishing and shooting. There's some supplies that contain lead um, in the job sites, which we could talk a lot about oc occupational exposure to lead, which is not the focus of today, but some particularly um, high risk of lead exposure in plumbing, battery manufacturing, radiators, fire ranges, repair shops, and the like. And then lastly, a lot of cosmetics and cultural practices like bindi and kumkuma, tanaka, those substances themselves can contain a lot of lead or be composed of lead entirely like kumkuma. So luckily, there's been a lot of legislation on our side to reduce exposure universally to lead. I'm not going to go through every one of these, but some of them that, point, that stick out are one of the first pieces of legislation in 1971 where there's a ban, ban on some lead lead paint containing products and then in 1978 the one we already talked about the lead the ban on lead in residential paint and then lastly uh, the most recent in 2001 they created standards for dead lead dust in soil and in turn with these policies we've seen a decline in total blood lead levels and there are two different measurements the red is in blood lead levels over 10 micrograms and the blue is the total blood lead levels universally so why should we avoid lead? We've talked a little bit about the sources, but why is it such a big deal? I think you could ask anyone in this room and we could have an answer, but I wanted to kind of bring in some of the research and look at it all together. So I stole this picture from the World Health Organization, who is also, the, the WHO is also the sponsor of the International Lead Poison Prevention Week, which is why we're having events such as this today. So, so anyway, this, this figure goes through why lead is toxic at different age groups. And today we're gonna to really focus on why is it toxic to young children. So there are symptoms of lead toxicity. And there are some in the acute setting, but that is very much for very high levels of lead, well over 100 micrograms per deciliter. These kids can present with prolonged vomiting. They're not acting themselves or even waking up at all, and it can also lead to death. But what we need to focus on and what a new movement is focusing on are these much lower levels of lead at less than 10 or even less than 5. And I really want to focus on those. So we don't always see these, these side effects of lead exposure in the, the moment that kids are exposed. These are more long term. They may take years for these type of symptoms to present. But the symptoms listed well here for you, lower IQ, lower academic achievement, development of ADHD, antisocial behaviors, even delayed puberty, uh, lower postnatal growth, decreased hearing, spontaneous abor abortions in our pregnant moms, low birth weight, that runs the gamut. Again, I want to stress that we don't always see these symptoms right at the time of exposure, which is why prevention is, is the most important piece here. So I really wanted to do a shout out. This is, most people might know her, Dr. Mona, or Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha. She is the Flint pediatrician who cracked that case we already talked about. And she wrote a book, What the Eyes Don't See. It's on my, my list of reading materials. I haven't got there yet. Anyone read this one? OK, good. I wanted Echo's hand to go up, because she's actually uh, in possession of my copy right now. <laughs> but she's, anyway. Well, I'll get around to reading it. But the reason it's here is I wanted to give a shout out to her for all the preventive work and the, the, the clinical work she's still doing, as well as the research and advocacy component. But really, I just love the title of her book, What the Eyes Don't See. It really pushes home the fact that we don't always see the effects of lead exposure in that moment. So it also gives me the opportunity to make a really corny joke that even though we don't see in this moment, research give us, gives us vision that is 2020. So it's my opportunity to share some seminal graphs about lead exposure and the effect on the developing child uh, throughout the, several past, the past several decades. So uh, several of these next few slides are stolen from Dr. Walburn, I already gave a shout out to, who in turn stole them from <laughs> Dr. Bruce Lamphere, who is a very well-known and prominent researcher in environmental health. So the first comes from a New England Journal of Medicine 2003 article by Canfield et al. And it looks at blood lead levels correlating with IQ. And the, the red line is the mean surrounded by the blue lines, which is the standard deviation. So you don't need me to point out, but with increasing levels of lead, you have decreasing IQ. You lose IQ points with lead exposure. 
The next paper goes back quite a few decades to 1979, again from the New England Journal of Medicine. This is from Dr. Needleman et al. We have another Dr. Needleman in town who's a developmental pediatrician, different guy, but still doing good work. But this is probably very hard to see from the back, but on the x-axis, we have different behavioral symptoms. And on the y-axis, we have teacher-reported percentages of when teachers see these behaviors correlated with increasing levels of lead as collected from the dentine or the layer in the outside layer on the tooth. We have, uh, even back in 1979, had the technology to analyze heavy metals in teeth. And we've only increased that technology uh, today. So with increasing levels of lead in the teeth, we see increasing behavioral problems in the classroom. That's what this one boils down to. Uh, this is a very similar point put in a different presentation using different data. This, paper, this graph comes from the environmental health perspectives in 2006 by Braun et al. And we have quantiles of lead concentration and increasing adjusted odds ratio of the development of ADHD. And this had a lot of adjustments. And I should say the data that this was pulled out from was from a national survey called the National Health and Human Services Examination Survey, which is done every few years where researchers go out and collect blood from adults and kids and do a number of analysis, including heavy metal analysis. And they found that even when you adjust for age, sex, iron levels, whether kids or families have insurance or not, if they have been exposed to prenatal tobacco or not, even when you adjust for those, you still see a correlation of lead levels with development of ADHD. And this is the last research-based graph I'll share today. Uh, on the y-axis here, we have dates dating back to the 1870s all the way up to the 2000s that lead and murder rates correlate with each other. So now I've talked about some sources of lead and why we should care about those sources and how it affects our kids. I really wanted to bring it home to what happens to the individual. I think it's researchers, we can get really bogged down in the data and numbers, and clinicians, we can get bogged down in just the one person. So I think the public health picture of bringing all these worlds together with people who can make a difference like you guys in the audience is why we're here today. So since I'm coming more from a clinical background, I wanted to share a case of this little boy, David. I did change his name, uh, a little boy that I saw in the clinic a few months ago. So David is an Omaha resident. He's a pretty young guy, he's 21 months old, and he presented to my clinic for a six-month recheck of lead. And his lead was 38.4 micrograms per deciliter. So before I get into David's case, again, I want to step back again to, to review what we should think about. What does it mean to have a high level? What is a high level of lead? So in 2005, the CDC gave us a guideline that we have a level of concern of over 10 micrograms per deciliter. Then in 2002, the C or 2012, the CDC came back and said, wait, 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 let's not use level of concern anymore. Now we have a reference level, and this reference level is five micrograms per deciliter. And this is not an arbitrary number. It is based on that same um, data that one of our figures came from, the National Health and Human Examination Survey in Haines. From 2007 to 2010, the five micro micrograms per deciliter was at the 97.5th percentile of those surveys. But what I want to point out, again, we've already heard this today, there's no safe level of lead for our kids. So the CDC has put out some clinical guidelines for how clinicians should react to an elevated lead level. And our David had 38.4, so he's between 20 and 44 micrograms per deciliter. So CDC says that clinicians should perform a history and physical, which he'd get anyway, uh, lab, lab work, iron and blood counts, uh, x-ray of his tummy, an environmental investigation of his home, and a follow-up lead to see that he's coming down. So we're going to step through each of these for David's case. So he did present for elevated lead, and in 2017, he already had an elevated lead, and we'll go more into that in a bit. Uh, but currently, with this presentation at 38.4, he had no symptoms, no constipation, he didn't have any protracted vomiting, no change in his behavior. Um, he likes to play outside, he has been seen eating the soil in his yard, and his yard is in the Superfund site. 
He does have a puppy who likes to go inside and outside the home and likes to dig in the dirt and track it inside. Um, but he had a normal birth history, has no past medical problems, no family history, no surgical history, he doesn't take any medicines, no allergies, and he's fully vaccinated. For social history, he lives with his mom, who's not currently seeking employment outside the home, and his dad's an accountant, and he has a healthy three-year-old brother. He does build, live in a house built in 1910, before 1978, inside the Superfund site. Uh, he doesn't spend any time outside of the home, really, and no recent home renovations. And no s recent smoke exposure or travel exposure or travel experience. He does drink the tap water, and mom doesn't remember ever having tested the water for lead, and no imported products inside the house, and he's meeting all his milestones developmentally. So on physical exam, he had normal vitals. In terms of his length and weight, he is tracking along nicely. He's, he's doing great. So we did do some lab work. We took a sample straight from the vein, and his blood counts were normal. Uh, but we did find with his iron studies that he was iron deficient. So we started some iron supplementation for him. And then we already know why he's here. He's got a lead of 38.4. So again, what do we do about that? How did he get to 38.4? I had already mentioned the year prior he was already high. Did we do anything about that? What was it? And so forth. So let's step through that. So again, back to the CDC and how they guide our care of kids exposed to lead. In 1991, the CDC recommended universal screening of kids. Then in 2005, they came back with a revision and they paired with the American Academy of Pediatrics with, with this one that they wanted states and cities to create their own protocol for testing. Because I, I kind of stepped through with the sources of lead. Each city has different sources. Of course, there's the universal sources of lead paint and, and imported products. But in Omaha, we have a very specific source, which was in the soil. So with that said, the CDC still wanted universal screening if the child lived in a home in a community with over 27% of the houses built before 1950, or if there's a prevalence of over 12% percent of one to three year olds testing over 10 micrograms per deciliter. But even the American Academy of Pediatrics who paired with the 2005 guidelines came out with a policy statement in 2016 that says that we're already falling behind and these recommendations aren't holding up. We need to revisit them. So now that we know what's going on nationally or at least have a better idea, what do we do here in Nebraska? So I don't expect you to read this, even people sitting in the front row. This is just a, a screenshot of the November 2015 guidelines from the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. It has three criteria for how to test kids for lead. And we'll step through each of those pretty quickly here. So the first criterion is based on geography. If a child lives in these zip codes in red, we want them tested at one and two years. And if they haven't been screened at that point, any time after that. And then I did point out in Omaha, we have, very, we have some different recommendations because of our history as a super fun site. The, the Douglas County Health Department, who's here today, uh, has recommended that we should screen kids for lead every year from one to six years old. Criterion two, uh, back to the state's recommendation, is based on Medicaid and WIC status. For Medicaid, they want kids tested at one and two years, and any time after that if they hadn't been tested before. And for WIC, they just want one lead at any time upon enrollment if the child is over 12 months old. And question, or criterion three is a questionnaire. It's got six questions here, and I think it's meant to be a catch-all for all the kids who don't meet the geography or the Medicaid or WIC status criterion. And can't really read all those way back there, but the highlights are a child should be tested if they live in a house built before 1950, if they live in a house built before 1978 and there's recent renovation, if they know anyone with lead poisoning, if there's any hobbies or cultural activities that may predispose the kid or expose them to lead, and if the child is a special population, which the definition here of a special population is an immigrant, a foster child, uh, a refugee, a migrant, or a foreign adoptee. And then no matter how or when you sample lead for a child, whether it's a capillary uh, finger poke or a venous sample, all lead levels have to be reported to your, your local public health department. For us, it's Douglas County within seven days. 
So again, let's get back to David. He's at 38.4. What was he before that year before? He was at 8.6 when we did a capillary blood sample, and that's a little finger poke. We do know for some local research, it was done as a quality improvement project in the UNMC Children's Physicians Clinic with Dr. Arwa Nasser, who's the last author here, and some of her colleagues. They did a, we, we're having a lot of false positives for capillary lead in our clinic. Why is this happening? What if we change our hand washing practice? What if instead of using an alcohol swab to clean the finger, the tip of the finger, what if we did uh, soap and water for 20 seconds? Would we reduce the number of false positives? Sure enough, they did. So they, these are the total number of participants. And they had 14 false positives out of 350 before the study. And then they had two out of 409 after the study. So this shows that hand washing is important. We already know that. The CDC has already told us that. But everyone should wash their hands, particularly before these lead screenings. So it's just a little side note. So back to David again. He tested with a finger poke at 8.6 with proper hand washing. What should we do? How should we follow that up? Again, the CDC is our friend and has given us really good guidelines. If it's between five and nine, we need a confirmatory venous sample straight from the vein in at least one to three months after that initial capillary blood. So what was David's? We waited one week and his was 11.9, a lot higher than we expect. We actually expect it to be lower than that 8.6, but it wasn't. And now he's, he's kind of triggering some of our other resources in Douglas County. So what do we do with David at 11.9? Well, the county, like I said, throws in our resources. If a kid screens over 9.5, Douglas County will go to the child's house, perform a risk assessment, or work with partners who will do this with them, and they'll prepare a report and send it to the property owner for what needs to be addressed. If a child tests between 5 and 9.5, the county will do all these services, but they won't automatically get done. The property owner will get a letter that they are eligible for these services, and they can opt in for that service. So David's parents took advantage of it. When he was 11.9, they had the county come out and take a look at their house. The county found that there were high levels, or there was lead present in the deck paint and on the paint on the exterior of the house. So there. Remedy was to place a carpet over the, the leaded paint on the porch and strip and repaint the exterior of the house. So now he's still at this 11.9. How should we follow that up? We're going to go back to the CDC guidelines. If he's between 10 and 19, we should follow up in at least one to three months. Sure enough, we did, and he's starting to come down, 9.4. Looking, looking okay, still high, but on the downward trend. So when should we follow this one up? Again, if it's between 10 and 19, but on the downward trend, we can retest in three to six months. And guess where this puts us? At the 38.4. So we followed all the guidelines, put all our resources into place, and he's still screened high. So what's going on here? Before we get to that, and we're going to keep stepping through those CDC guidelines for how we should take care of David in this moment. So part of that was getting an abdominal x-ray. I'm not going to ask anyone to interpret this, but it's no obstruction, no lead here. He's a little bit constipated, though, like many of our kids here in Omaha. So just good. We've got this. We have it as a baseline. Let's move on. So we did another environmental investigation, even though we had already done one the year prior. So that's check mark on that one. So when we went back out to his house, they found that the exterior deck still contained the lead because all, they, all we had done was put a carpet over it. And they found another source that had evaded our investigation the year prior. They had leaded paint on the interior of the home in the stairwell, and it looked like it had been chipped off recently. So during this renovation time, the family, David and his parents, and his three-year-old brother moved in with relatives, which I want to point out that not all kids in Omaha have that option. Some have to continue to live in the homes while they're being renovated. Um, and sadly, they gave the puppy away because they didn't want one more source of lead being tracked inside and outside the home. And speaking of that, I did point out that David and his family live in the Superfund site. Um, we did retest the soil, but I'm not sure what the level was. Need to, to close that loop there. So now that he's at 38.4, how should we follow David up? We're going to follow these guidelines. He's between 25 and 44. So it says we should retest at least in two weeks to one month. We were really worried about David, so we waited one week, and his mom was worried too. So she went ahead and brought him in, and we retested, and he was already coming down to 27. 
more guidelines. When do we retest? We're starting a downward trend, but we can't just give up on David. So we rechecked in two months, and he's still coming down at 19 months. And he'll be due for another screen in about three to six months. So I mentioned David's big brother. Uh, if David has high lead, wouldn't you think his brother would too? Uh, fortunately, no. Uh, I wouldn't say he has high lead, but he still has had detectable, le detectable levels every time we've tested them. And this is my plug to say that there's no safe level of lead for kids. So now I'm not gonna go through every single piece of the CDC guidelines with this next case, but I did wanna throw in Lexi's case, who's a little bit older and had a much higher lead level and what we did differently for her and why. So she's five years old and she was living in central Nebraska, came into UNMC because her lead was 59.9. So based on these same guidelines, very similar workup as David got, but the difference is here is that the Department of Health and Human Services wants us to get an extra lab called free erythrocyte protoporphyrin, which is a marker for chronic lead exposure, and wants us to administer oral chelation and admission to the hospital if we can't ensure a safe environment for Lexi. So Lexi's sources, I'm gonna boil everything down. Um, she's been known to put everything in her mouth even though she's not at that typical one to three year old put everything in the mouth age range, she's still doing it. Um, and her stepfather has a number of potentially risky occupations that have exposed him to lead. Uh, he loads food for a truck, he builds semi-trailers, and he hangs metal in a galvanizing company. And lastly, after a lot of investigation by a lot of partners, they found that Lexi had peeling paint in, in her bedroom around the windows that had obviously been picked off. No one actually saw her put it in her mouth, though. So what did we do with her? We followed the, the medical guidelines from the CDC. We admitted her because we could not ensure there was a safe environment. And we did that free uh, protoporphyrin, and it was elevated at 216, which is not surprising to anyone. And then we did oral chelation with susimer, which was at 200 milligrams. And we did home paint lead mitigation. And then I did want to talk a bit about Susimer, not in too much detail, but it's a, it's a wonderful drug that binds all the harmful heavy metals that could be circulating in the body, like lead, cadmium, or mercury, but it leaves the essential metals alone, like zinc and calcium. And so this was kind of a question that came to me. Of, we gave Lexi this oral chelation therapy, but we didn't give David. And he, didn't, he still had high levels, but he didn't have as high levels as Lexi. There's actually a paper out there that supports why we didn't do it for David. The uh, paper came out in Pediatrics in 2004, and this group of researchers looked at over around 2,000 kids from one to nine years. So they followed these kids for nine years, and they found that kids between 20 and 44 who received oral chelation had no neurodevelopmental benefits from having received that. Only the kids who were testing over 44 had a benefit with their brain development with oral chelation. So this leads me to what are we doing here? And this is Dr. Echo Perlman's work with Nebraska Methodist College. She's been going out to the area of Omaha Public School schools with an RV. I keep calling it a bus, but it's this behemoth. It's part of the diabetes screening initiative with Nebraska Methodist College, but they've given some access to, to Echo and colleagues to test kids, screen them with a capillary finger poke where they are in the schools. Of course, they have to be consented to participate, but hopefully, uh, Echo, you send all kinds of materials home with families. They sign it. The kids come on the RV, get their finger pokes, and get a lead result within three minutes. So I wanted to share a little bit of Echo's data. This is from 2016. She did 461 screens. Uh, 350, about 354 of those were, uh, had been screened before, and the remainder had never been screened, which opens up a lot of questions. Why aren't they being screened? Do they not go to the doctor? Are the doctors following the recommendations and guidelines? So of those first time, 23% of those were, 30% of them tested over five micrograms per deciliter. And this is a conservative number because not all kids who tested over five came in to get a repeat venous sample. So it opens up a lot of questions or what the barriers are to getting this repeat screen. And then previously tested, about 87% of those were, and only 4% of those had levels over five micrograms per deciliter. Echo's data looks a little bit different for 2017. She almost doubled her numbers, or 
did double your numbers at 900. And first-time screeners were 13%, and only 7% of those tested over 5 micrograms per deciliter. For those previously screened, only 4% tested over 5 micrograms. So this is an opportunity to talk about what I think we could do to increase our screening and to increase how we take care of these kids. I think there's need for a dedicated lead clinic here in Omaha. It doesn't have to necessarily be physician run. It could be a nurse. It just needs case management to follow up on these kids slipping through the cracks. Uh, we need legislation for universal screening. Universal screening can mean a lot to different people. Um, I'll just throw it out. My opinion would be universal at one, two, three, maybe four. Um, other people have different ideas. Uh, current talk is having universal screening for kids to have a number before they enter kindergarten, which is around five or six years old, which might be a little bit too late. Uh, third initiative is mandatory remediation of those residential properties that tested over 400. I had mentioned it was an opt-in for the, the property owner. Uh, lastly, this can go for a number of initiatives here in Omaha. We need more funding. And lastly, which is why we're here, is to collaborate and to work together and not really taking a little piece and keeping it on our own, but let's collaborate. So with that, I want to share a few resources. I'm wrapping it up here, you guys. In 2016, I had referenced a policy statement by the, the Council on Environmental Health through the American Academy of Pediatrics about lead poisoning and prevention. There's the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. We're in Region 7, and our sits in Kansas City. If you ever had a need to refer or get more information, they've got a ton. There's the Children's Environmental Health Network, nonprofit out of D.C. There are local health departments in the state, as well as Omaha Healthy Kids Alliance, who had a wonderful event yesterday. And then a plug, this is a new initiative through the Children's Environmental Health Network. They have named a National Day in honor of Children's Environmental Health, which is now the second Thursday of every month. And Governor Pete Ricketts proclaimed that for this year, and Mayor Stothert uh, proclaimed it for last year. And we're doing more things like uh, what we're doing today and yesterday in honor of International Lead Poisoning Prevention Week. And then this is a shameless plug for some research that I've been doing here is looking at heavy metals in our donor blood product. Because currently we don't screen donor blood for heavy metals, even when we give them to preterm infants and kids who get recurrent blood transfusions. So if that one particular donor is high, we don't even know. So if you want to participate, if you live in the Superfund zip codes, I have a sign out outside that I could contact you for our next blood drive. These are my numerous references. And then lastly, I wanted to say some thank yous. Uh, a few people sitting in the audience here, and thank you to all the organizers and sponsors for today's event.